Hello, folks. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see you. Nice to see everyone. How are we doing? Happy, happy Lagba Omer. We have like this much of it left. I thought I thought I probably wouldn't celebrate by lighting a bonfire in the office. I don't think either the dogs or Joe would appreciate that. Um, but it is in fact still Lagba Omer. So a good uh, a good time to be studying. How is everyone doing? Are we all well? Okay, I am seeing a couple of folks are still connecting to audio. So I am vamping until you get connected up. Um, and uh, I hope that everybody, I hope that everybody got my email. Yeah. Uh, and uh, tonight we are going to be looking at a common Jewish object, but as um, uh, as is my hope with the uh, with this course, I hope that what I'm doing is revealing that Jewish objects that we think we we think we know all about um, have still got some secrets to offer us. So in a moment, we will start looking at Talit. Um, uh, Dana, Dana wants to share a couple of her Talit. Dana, that comes as absolutely zero surprise to me whatsoever. I had a feeling that you would jump at the chance to do that. But does uh, does anyone else on the call have a, have a Talit that they would like to share? Okay, Hal and Kathy and Liddy and Kim and Judith. Good. So we have Mar Mar Marvin too. Hmm? Uh, Marvin too. I have a tally to uh, show. Lovely, great, Marvin. Okay, uh, so we probably have more tally talk tonight than we do texts, which is great. <laughs> it means that it means that we are living, uh, we are ourselves living examples of texts. Hello, Mary Lynn. Long time no see. Um, very nice to see you again, Mary Lynn. And I got the opportunity to meet face to face at the uh, the Shabbaton last uh -huh. weekend, um, along with a couple of other people on the call. Um, so do we have any dedications for our study tonight? Just it's a small enough class to go ahead and unmute and share them with your voices. Do we want to dedicate our study tonight to uh, to anyone um, for a happy reason, for a sad reason, for a different reason? Um, just go ahead and unmute and uh, and let me know, or or and or pop it in the chat. Kim, I see you. You are being very polite and using the hand raising apparatus. Yeah, um, I'd like to dedicate it to Rachel Brody. Of course, of course. So we lift up our study tonight for Rachel Brody. Thank you. Any other dedications tonight to Rena Friedman? Thank you, Amy. Uh, any other dedications? Okay, uh, so let's say the bracha for study and we can get started. Uh, just a reminder, <clears throat> pardon me, guess who forgot? Oh, I actually remembered to bring in a glass of water this time. Mm. The um, uh, the bracha for study is the same as the bracha that we would say over uh, Shabbat candles or any other mitzvah, except the words on the end are la'asok b'divrei Torah, to engage in words of Torah. So feel free to unmute if you would like to. You don't have to. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu menet ha'olam. Fantastic. And I want to say now, I want to make sure that I remember to give a special shout out to Brittany, who has volunteered to be our Zoom host for the meeting. That's Brittany there. Everybody give Brittany a wave. The luxury of having somebody else host the meeting while I am teaching is still something that is new to me um and it it feels like it feels like a real gift a real luxury so Brittany thank you very very much indeed very kind of you 
Um, and Brittany is also somebody I met on the Shabbat, the Shabbaton last week. Okay, so I am going to share my screen. And here we have, um, I've, I've, uh, I've tried to look um, in the materials uh, for different kinds of uh, talitot, different examples of talitot. But of course, we have our own examples in the class as well. Just jiggle the screen around. Um, again, forgive me for actually being inside the document while I'm teaching. But if I do the fancy schmancy presentation mode, it means that I can't see any of you. And to me, that completely defeats the object of doing the teaching in the whole in the first place. The whole point is for us to be able to see each other a little bit and um, and react to each other. Um, I'll also be stopping the sharing from time to time so that people can share their talitot. But let's start right away with the key talit text. Um, thank you. Uh, just had a quick read of the chat. Thank you so much. That is very kind. Uh, the key talit text. Um, who would like to be our first reader this morning? This after, uh, no, this evening, sorry. It's morning somewhere in the world. It's probably morning where Joe is. Um, who, would, who would like to be our first reader? Don't be shy. I'll do it. Thank you, Florine. And obviously in English, unless you particularly want to do the Hebrew. No, I can't okay. see that small print. Okay. God spoke to Moses as follows. Speak to the Israelite people and instruct them to make for themselves fringes on the corners of their garments throughout the ages. Let them attach a strand of blue to the fringe at each corner. That shall be your fringe. Look at it and recall all God's mitzvot and observe them so that you do not go straying after your heart and your eyes. Thus, you shall be reminded to observe all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am God, your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I, God, am your God. Thank you. Thank you, Florine. That's lovely. We don't necessarily need the biblical reference. Uh, this is quite possibly a familiar text to us. Um, it is going to be picked up by the rabbis and put into the liturgy and comprise the first paragraph, the third paragraph of the Shema. So we're going to say it in the morning and in the evening of, ev uh, of every day. And in the morning, uh, when we can see our tzitziot, because this paragraph says that you must be able to see them, which is why we wear them in the morning, but not at night, um, we're going to kiss them. We gather, to, we gather them together and kiss them when we say this paragraph. Okay. So um, in my in my Chumash with Rashi class that I teach at the Ziegler School, I have a lovely group of students who are just coming up their, uh, their final exam, which I am in the process of writing and setting. And I make it uh, very clear to them right from the beginning of the class that one of the things that is going to concern our commentators is when the Torah repeats itself. The view of the view of our commentators, the traditional view, is that Torah is a text that doesn't waste energy. Torah only really needs to say anything once. So when Torah repeats itself, something is going on. And there's a lot of repetition in this paragraph. I am happy to take one of two answers for what are the words that repeat in this paragraph. What are the repeaters? You can pop it in the chat or you can unmute and tell me. Fringes. Fringes, yes, good. The word that in Hebrew is tzitzit and yes, fringe and God. God and fringes, fringes and God, bang, 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 bang. 
goes the Torah. You can, you can almost hear the nails being hammered home here. I am God. I am your God. Ani Adonai Eloichem. It repeats a little bit more in the English translation than it does in the Hebrew, but that's only because Hebrew has got multiple words for God or that we translate as God. Yeah. So fringes and God, God and fringes. And important, we don't know exactly when this came into the liturgy as something that as a matter of course, we say twice a day, we're bound to say it twice a day. But the fringes and God feel like they are at the heart of something, as indeed they are going to turn out to be. So when the rabbis come to look at this paragraph, and, and just a reminder that when I say the rabbis in that irritating way that rabbis have of saying the rabbis, um, it doesn't mean uh, the clergy of Ikar. I mean, we are rabbis, we're very good rabbis, I happen to think, but that's who I'm, that's not who I'm talking about. I am talking about the generation of teachers before during and after the destruction of the second temple by the Romans. And those are the rabbis who we can really credit with inventing the Judaism that we practice. I've said before, and I'll say again, Judaism has its roots in the Hebrew Bible. It draws from the Hebrew Bible, but it is not a biblical religion. It's not a biblical practice. It's a rabbinic practice. The words are here. The ideas are here. But it was the rabbis who put wheels on those ideas and made them go and turned them into the customs and the traditions that we still practice today. And it was it's like that with mezuzah, where the rabbis looked at the paragraph and said, OK, how are we going to do this then? How are we going to turn this into a thing? Um, it was like that, as we saw last time we met with the Shabbat candles, where the mitzvah of lighting Shabbat candles is not even in the Torah. The rabbis take that mitzvah and reverse engineer it back into the Torah like they thought we wouldn't notice. Yeah. And the mitzvah of tzitzit is similar in that the rabbis, uh, the rabbis looked at this text and thought, well, fringes are clearly important we'd better make them into a thing. So the first thing that we learn about a talit, we learn in passing. The cloth on the, of the talit is not the important bit, not initially. The important bit of a, of a talit is the fringes. A talit with no fringes is not a talit, it's just a piece of cloth. So any piece of cloth, here we are, a strand of blue to the fringe at each corner. Do you see? Fringes on the corners of their garments. And the rabbis decide in their wisdom that a three-cornered garment, you know, a, a, a two-cornered garment does not exist. A three-cornered garment does not merit sits it. The mitzvah of tzitzit comes to attach to any garment with four corners. So in theory, any pashmina that we might own, any scarf that we might own, any shirt that is, whether short or long, that has slits up the sides to give it four corners, in theory, attracts the mitzvah of tzitzit. And gradually, with time, the tzitziot come to be attached to a separate garment that exists only for the purpose of carrying them. And there are two types. That is the garment that is going to be called the talit. It's related to the word tal or dew, something that lays upon something. Yeah, so the talit lays on us like the dew, and its purpose is to carry the tzitziot. Uh, tzitziot is plural of tzitzit. Its purpose is to carry the tzitziot on each corner, and the tzitziot are there somehow to remind us of God, and in particular, God's mitzvot. 
Okay, so the tzitzit are the important bit. Let me just do a quick check of the chat line. Uh, when did it become a male mitzvah as it is not time dependent? Lovely, yes. Uh, so a few things in the chat line that I want to lift up. Lovely. Um, corners show up more in this text than you would the need or expect. So the repetition is important, and that's how Tizio end up on garments with corners. And Susan is asking, it jumps us ahead a bit. But Susan is asking, why did Sitziot originally become only a male mitzvah? So in traditional Judaism, there are some mitzvot that are, that are thought only to apply to men. The category, and it's a somewhat permeable category, I have to be saying, although you'll accept that I've got an agenda here. The category as uh, is that mitzvot, that are positive mitzvot, obligations, do this, rather than negative mitzvot, don't do that, then uh, those mitzvot, if they are dependent on time, are mitzvot that men and only men should be doing. Now, follow me closely here. The short answer to Susan's question is that the mitzvah at Sitzit comes to be attached to the saying of the Shema. The same with tefillin. The Shema is time dependent. You've got to say these words when you lie down and when you rise up, which comes to be understood as in the morning and in the evening. If, I'm going to get out my Talmudic thumb here, if it is the case that the um, Shema, uh, that the Tzitziot are attached to the Talit, and if it is the case that the wearing of Tzitzit is something that is mentioned in the Shema, and if it is the case that the Shema is said in the morning and the evening, therefore, sorry, need the other thumb, therefore it follows that the mitzvah of tzitzit is time dependent. Do you see? So you have, to, you have to jump through a number of loops. With that said, women wearing talit is something that, uh, I mean, I don't know what women did in private before now, but women wearing talit in public is something that really only began, I would say it's still not mainstream, not by a long chalk. It's something that only began in the past century and this one. OK, so now women do wear talit um, and uh, you're talking to a woman who does. Um, and I think that there are women on the call who do as well. Um, I will say that it took me a long time to do it. I regarded it as a male mitzvah for a lot of the time. And in the same way as I wouldn't, I don't know, wear a three-piece suit, because um, I can, uh, although I could wear a three-piece suit, I suppose. But, uh, you know, think of a sample thing that really only men do. Why would I want to do that if I'm a woman? But I became gradually, slowly, I began persuaded, I, I became persuaded otherwise. And here we are. Okay. So here is my here is my next question. Let me let me reshare the screen again. Hang on, double check the chat. Good. Um, here is my next question. Why? Why is it if the tzitzit is there to remind us of God and the mitzvot, and the talit is there to carry the tzitzit? How does the tzitzit remind us of God and the mitzvot? I mean, why, why that? Does that, I mean, on, uh, let me just spotlight myself for a moment, actually, so that you can see it properly. Why does, why, why this particular thing? Why, where should this be the reminder of the mitzvot? Yeah, it's a it's a piece of knotted thread. Well, it's eight threads that are knotted in a particular knotted and wrapped in a particular configuration. Why should that, as opposed to anything else, be the thing that reminds us of the mitzvah? 
Has anybody ever come across, let me take the spotlight off, has anybody ever come across Sitsit Math? Sitsit Math is very, very cool. And we are going to look at it. I have a hand up from Leah and a hand up for, from, uh, yes, indeed, Susan, that's correct. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a hand up from Leah. Leah, talk to us, and then Florine. And uh, I, I, this is sort of just my conjecture that it is the umbilical cord that connects oh, us on Earth with, I'll say, God in heaven. That it, the two worlds get connected with it. It's, it's, it's a. I okay. see it as like a. Um, it's the four poles of the tent. The, the, the four corners of the tzitzit, where the tzitzit are hanging, and they're vertical, bringing, connecting us to something above. Beautiful. Tzitzit hang down with gravity. That really is gorgeous. That really is gorgeous. Leah, at some point, if you felt like writing that up or drawing, or I I don't know, if that made its way out into the world, that would be a, that would be a beautiful, beautiful thing. Lovely. Florine, yeah. Oh, we can't hear you, my love. We need you to unmute. My Kabbalist teacher often referred to the four knots as the four worlds. The four love. Exactly what Leah is referring to. Another version I heard in uh, Orthodox circles was uh, Yudke Vavke. Oh, that, nice. that they were the, the ineffable name. The, in the ineffable name. Beautiful. So the four knots of the one, two, three, except there are five. But the 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 four the four threads maybe the four threads of the tzitzit. Yeah, let's rescue this. The four threads, yeah, because there are four threads. You you thread them through the hole, and then they hang down, and they make a total of eight. I'm coming back to that. But the four threads being the four worlds, the four dimensions of reality, beautiful, or the four letters of God's personal name, Yud Hey Vav Hey. Lovely, lovely. So we're we're getting into the right kind of mindset for doing this kind of work. Let me share with you a, a few of the other traditional interpretations as to why it is that Davka, um, four threads knotted in a particular way, should do this job. Okay, sits it by numbers. Okay. Um, the first thing that we need to know is that Hebrew letters also act as numbers, okay? Hebrew letters have a numerical value. This baby is called gematria, and you can have a great deal of fun with gematria, adding up the... Um, uh, the reason that we're, the reason that we play with... Uh, hang on, let me... Ah, I had two examples and they drove into each other in my head. Uh, I'll come back to it. Okay, you'll you'll see you'll see what I mean as we go through. So Hebrew letters each have a numerical value. Integers one through ten are represented by the first ten letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph through Yud. Uh, then the then the um, the counting by ten, so twenty to ninety, is represented by the next letters, and then kuf represents one hundred. Resh is two hundred. Shin is three hundred. Taf is four hundred. And if you have all of those, you can play. You can make those into any number that you need to make it. This, by the way, is why you see Jewish years represented with those four letters. Tough shin together gives us seven hundred, and then the numbers on the end. Right now, we are in Tush Pug, um, fifty-seven eighty-three. You get the idea, yeah. So in Torah. The word tzitzit is written tzade yud tzade taf. Okay. 
the Rashi spelling, because well, it's Rashi who gives us this math, is Tzadi Yud Tzadi Yud Tuf. Do you see? He threw a Yud in there. So, question, what is the numerical value of the word Tzitzit? And remember, we're trying to get to the number of mitzvot in the Torah. Somebody has already put it in the chat, but how many mitzvot are there in the Torah? Ostensibly? 613. 613 by tradition. In fact, there are 611 and we have to do a wiggle with the math. Um, but that's OK, because we can do that. Um, so 600, 613. So we're aiming to get to 613 here so that the tzitzit will remind us of the uh, of the mitzvot. All right. So here's how it goes. The Hebrew letter Tzade adds up to 90. The Hebrew letter Yud adds up to 10. Tzitzi gives us how much? 200. 200. Very good. And the Tuf gives us another? 400. 400. 200 plus 400 is? 600. Okay, so we're already nearly there. Ta-da. All right. How many threads, when you look at a tzitzit, I'm going to hold it up to the camera. When you look at a tzitzit head on, how many threads do you see? Eight. eight. Lovely. 608. And how many knots? Five. Five. Giving us? 613. Thank eight. you. And I will be here all week. Okay. So that's one <coughs> way of explaining how the um the tzitzit <laughs> so adds uh reminds us of all of the mitzvot and it's mm -hmm. lovely right it's on on the one hand it's rabbi thank you yeah on the one hand, I'm back, I'm back. On the one hand, it's fanciful, and on the other hand, it's really, really clever. Yeah, here is a little doodah that is going to remind us of the mitzvot every time we look at it, but there's more. All right, look at the winding, look closely at the winding. Okay, this is a this first one is a wind of seven. And the second one is a wind of eight. Seven plus eight equals 15. 15 in gematria, anybody? Fifteen in gematria are the letters hey, hey. Yeah. Yeah. and hey, yeah. all right, which normally we never write out because they are the first two letters of God's personal name. OK, so now we are looking for a vav hey. 11 is a compound of six vav and five hey. There is God's name, Florine. That's how you get the tetragrammaton out of the out of the tzitziot. Yeah, God's four letter name. All right. And not just that. But the final word, the final wind is 13 winds around, and 13 in gematria is equivalent to the word echad that we get at the end of the Shema. Aleph is one, plus chet is eight, makes nine, plus dalad is four, makes 13. Isn't it lovely stuff? Okay, so that's part of the secret of the tzitzit, okay? And the talit is there to hold them, and the talit is there to wrap us up in them. When we make the bracha on the talit, we'll be coming to this. It's lehitatef, it's to wrap ourselves up. Ma'atefa um, uh, in modern Hebrew is an envelope, yeah? To wrap ourselves up in, uh, in the mitzvot. Florin, I see your hand. I have a question about the Hebrew, where you say in Torah. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand what Rashi is doing with the Yud's twice in order to get the E sound. 
But in t the Torah, why did they put the yud there? Uh, why didn't they put the yud there? No, why did they put any yud there? Why did they put any any hint of a vowel? Because in Torah, there are no vowels when you read Torah. Correct, but the but the word in the Torah text is just written way. There it is. But that's very strange. That's just how Torah spells it. Yeah, the spellings of things in Torah are very uh, are altogether interesting, and as you can see, they are these springboards for human beings to create meaning. You're right. It is strange. It could have been, I think you need that first yud so that you wouldn't read it something like set set. Ah. Yeah. yeah. But the, the second yud is not there. So it's quite sneaky of Rashi to put it in. And of course, if, if you don't put that yud in, the numbers don't work. Yeah. So we're 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 playing, but it's serious. Yes, absolutely, Susan. Basically, one can do anything with gematria if you manipulate it enough. Absolutely true. And and that is part of the fun. Uh, another thing that I learned while I was uh, while I was researching this is that um, uh, apparently the words Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Moses, our teacher, add up to 613 and tada. Yeah. So I tried the gematria on that multiple times. I tried it with variant spellings. I'm blowed if I can make Moshe Rabbeinu add up to 613. But if anybody can, then jolly good luck to you. That would be great. OK, so it's playful, but it isn't. It's also clever. Yeah, it's also clever. It's also, we have this mysterious object that we can make with our hands. It's really quite straightforward. It's, a, it's not at all easy to make, to fill in. But just about anybody who can tie a knot can make a tzitzit. Yeah, I made these ones. They're on my, they're on my travel talit. And the ones on the, the talit that I wear on Shabbat in shul, you can come and take a look. The um, were knotted on by my sister before I came to California. So you can find all over Google, you can turn any, uh, any piece of cloth with four corners into a talit and you can knot your own tzitzit. You just need to reinforce the edges somewhat against the uh, against the pulling of the knot. So the next thing to ask is how does the um, how does the making of tzitziot evolve? And for this, we need to go to Maimonides. We we need to go to Ramba. Um, you will probably have seen, us moderns will have seen tzitziot with blue. In the Torah, remember, in the Torah text, it says that you need to put a blue thread in there. Yeah, a blue thread. Trelet is the color of the sky, azure. Yeah. So let's have somebody be Rambam just for just for the moment, because I want him to talk to us about the about the blue and the white. Somebody be Rambam for us. Marv will be Rambam. Thank you very much. Welcome. In. The tassel we make on the corners of our garment from the same fabric as the garment is called tzitzit fringe because it resembles the fringe of a person's hair. As it says, he took me by the fringe of my hair from Yechezkel. The tassel is called white because we are commanded not to dye it. The Torah does not say how many strands should be in the tassel. Then we take the strand of wool that is dyed a sky-like color and wind, wind it around the tassel. The strand is called techelet. The Torah does not say how many times the strand should be wound around the tassel. So the mitzvah consists of two commandments, actually. The first to create the tassel from the garment and the second to wrap the tassel in blue in a blue strand, the verse says, both make themselves fringes and attach a strand of blue. There need to be four fringes, one on each corner to make up the, uh, to make up the mitzvah 
And when the person wears a talit, whether with white fringes or techelet or both, they are performing a single mitzvah, Rambam, Mishnah, Torah, Tzitzit, one, one, five. Thank you. With a big cut in the middle, actually, um, where he goes into considerably more detail. So this explains, first of all, why you will sometimes see tzitziot that are tied like this. And sometimes you will see tzitziot with blue threads in them that are tied like this. What you probably won't see are tzitziot that are any other color than white or blue. I asked about this when I was getting a talit made because I had an idea that it would be really lovely to have one white one, one blue one, one gold one, and one silver one. And Rabbi Chaim Wino, who knows about such things, said, no, Deborah, you can't do that. They need to be, so to an extent, they're plain. Um, we uh, The idea, at least in Rambam's time, is that they're made of the same fabric as the talit. So if your talit is wool, your tzitzia are made of wool. These days, there are greater leniencies. And even a couple of centuries ago, you would get these beautiful kind of silken talitot. Yeah. And then the fringes would be made of silk. Uh, the little old talitot, do, do people, have people seen one? They tend to be the kind of things that our grandfathers wear. And colloquially, they're called a yekka talis. Yekka is a uh, um, uh, loving but slightly tongue-in-cheek way of referring to Jews from Germany who dressed up for shul and wore jackets, yekkas. Um, so, uh, you know, these, these very, these very proper Jews and the talitot there tend to be quite narrow and made of silk with, uh, with silk strands on, on the end. Um, but what I want to, what I want to focus on in here is the blue, because we're going to be going somewhere with the blue. There are secrets in the blue. Um, and for a very, very long time, it was unclear, I mean, for centuries, it was unclear how this trelet could be made. We know from the Talmud that it's a dye that was made, it's a kind of sort of indigo, but it's made from snails. It's made from a particular type of snail called the chilazon. And as the diaspora spread and moved away from areas where you could find those kind of snails easily or on every street corner, the tradition became that we should not make pretend trelet, and instead Atsitsiot can just be white, and that's okay. It's a kosher talit. And so it was until really after the foundation of the of the state of Israel, when the um, when the, a group of people became pretty certain that they'd found the right kind of snail again. So when you order, you can now order trelet. Um, and when you when you order it, it will come from a particular, um, I can't remember whether it's a kibbutz or a moshav or a settlement on the West Bank. That's where they found the snails. Um, and they are pretty certain that this is correct trelet, kosher trelet. Um, and you can order and then you can decide for yourself, are you going to wind your threads like this or are you going to wind your threads like that? Or for whatever reason, are you going to stick with white tzitziot? Um, so that is the that is the position at the moment. Let me just, uh, so I hope I've answered Rina's question, when did the requirement for blue die away? It went with, uh, it went with the snails, correct? Um, and uh, cerulean blue, yes, or uh, the blue, well, we'll see, because I, I want to go a little bit deeper or further, however you want to think of it. It's significant, or at least I believe it to be significant, this idea of blue. Why blue? Yeah. Um, blue is not a color that occurs in nature very much, unless you're going to talk about the sky. 
and the reflection of the sky in the ocean. But, you know, there aren't really, you know, blueberries are not really blue. They're certainly not chelet colored. In fact, absent artificial dyes, I'm quite hard pushed to think of something that we eat. Maybe there's an edible flower somewhere, but I'm quite hard pushed to think of something that we eat, something that we ingest, something that is down here on the lower level. Um, that is uh, that is that kind uh, that kind of blue. Yeah. So let's go a little further into the blue. Um, there we are. There's a nice picture of blue. One of my favorite um, teachings here. Uh, please, would somebody be Rabbi Meir for us? This is a teaching from the Babylonian Talmud. I'll try to read it. Thank you. It was taught. Rabbi Mayer used to ask why Sechelet is different from any other color that could have been chosen, Manishtana. <laughs> and the reason is that Sechelet resembles the sea, and the sea resembles the firmament, and the firmament resembles the throne of glory, as it says. And under his feet, there was a kind of sapphire construction, as pure as the sky itself. And also a throne which looked like a sapphire. Okay. So what does this tell us? What, what's Rabbi Meir teaching us about blue as distinct from any other color? What makes blue special? According to Rabbi May. Rab blue is a, a royal color. It's a royal color. Throne, king. Thrones and Although, kings. Okay. But specifically, which king? Oh, God. Yes. Yeah, it, it's important, especially in the week of a coronation, you know, where they're all um, they're all tootling around in their purple robes. Yeah. Um, by the way, purple probably has some way of go. I, I wouldn't know, but it would be interesting to see how purple came to. I think it's Roman, actually, um, how purple came to be the, the royal color. But anyway, OK, so blue is a color that specifically connotes or suggests God. And and why is that? Why is that? Rina, I see a hand up. Uh, yeah, I, I love this passage because, you know, we have a, a brachot to say on just seeing general beauty in the world. But there is a specific bracha to say, which I, I was you know, it was such an honor to say last week when I went and I walked on the beach at sunset. We say a very specific bracha when we see the great ocean. That's true. And that, and that conjures up, you know, the enormity of the creative potential of the divine. So for me, this is, it's just so beautiful that, that the color is being associated with the sea. And that is one of the, the most beautiful aspects of, of nature that has its own blessing. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just mute you down because you have a little uh, you have a little background noise going on there. Nobody else here. No? Okay, so it's it's some kind of interference. But um I will I will mute you with love. Thank you. I will mute I I mute you with love because that was a lovely thought. Look at the and and I want to ride on on what Rena said. Look at the directions here. Yeah. So we start with the ocean. We start with the down here because at least for Rabbi Meir, it's not that the sun reflects into the sea and makes it blue. It's that we start at the bottom with the blue sea. Maybe a memory a memory of the waters of creation, because look, the next place we're going is the firmament. Remember, the firmament is that kind of diaphragm in, uh, in the sky that is holding the water of the sky away from the earth. That's the rakia, that's, that's the firmament. So we're going, look, we're going up. Blue takes us up. Blue is an ascending color. 
We go from the sea to the sky. We go from the sky to above the sky to the throne of glory. And this reference to the sapphire pavement, which is from that very um, strange episode in Exodus when, uh, where, uh, where prophets actually go up and have dinner with God um, in the Mount Sinai narrative. The floor of heaven is blue. The sky is blue because we're seeing the floor of heaven. And we're going up and up and up. It's, it, it's almost you take a balloon ride in here. So, Florine, let me, let me take the question or comment. Unmute, unmute. I see this as a reflection of the lower world reflecting the upper world. Mm, lovely. Lovely. The potentiality to do that. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. So why? So according to Rabbi Mayer, if you if you had him here and could sit him down and talk to him, um, and you were to ask him, okay, Rabbi Mayer, thank you for your thoughts about Tchelet, but why do I need that in my tzitzit? Why can't I have a green tzitzit or a brown tzitzit? Why do I need, what does, what does Trelet with your associations add to my tzitzit and the job that the, uh, the job that the tzitzit are, are doing? Why does the Torah say that the thread has to be a blue thread, according to Rabbi Meir? Yeah. Rina. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the connection to the sea is the connection to the creative potential of God, that that, that is the, the most beautiful, the, the most, you know, enormous creation that could be imagined in the time period that this was, that this was written. Okay, that's lovely. And therefore, when you have a uh, when you have a tzitzi in your hand, when you're holding your tzitziot in in your hand with their with their blue threads or at least their imagined blue threads, you're on that elevator. Yeah, you're moving up. And also, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of what Leah said. Um, where are you, Leah? I'm thinking of what Leah said and the attachment to creation and the creator. Maybe Florine's idea of the upper worlds and the lower worlds becoming conjoined. Yeah, that sense. I don't think I'm ever going to see it in quite the same way again, Leah. I, th I really want to sit with that mull. It's a beautiful, beautiful thought. Um, you know, this, this idea of the connection, yeah? So our tzitzit, as well as all of that left brain stuff of, well, these are the numbers and this is this and it's this many knots and it's this many threads and 613 of the other thing. And if you take this and put it with this, you can do this and you can do this. That's all, that's all very left brain. Yeah. But if we just want to come at it fuzzy, if we just want to come at it fuzzy, there's a connection that's getting made between the tzitzit and the talit and the sky that I want to explore. Hal and Kathy, yeah. Oh, oh, hi. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, um, so uh, about creation, though, uh, I mean, didn't creation start with every? everything was water and it was the separation of the water that was the one of the first steps so it's it's sort of like it's even you know in a sense before creation you know that that it's evoking that the lower waters and the upper waters and um you know i think yeah i mean we've been talking about that but but originally those waters were we're all all together. So that I find kind of fascinating. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is that we actually went a, a, num a number of years ago to an exhibit at the Norton Simon, 
uh, museum, the art museum in Pasadena, and it was on the color blue. The whole exhibit was on the color blue. I hope, and it was it was amazing. Uh, and you know, part of it is that, like you say, blue's very rare. Um, and but it was also incredible. You know, it well, and the rareness made it very valuable. But one of the few ways they could make a a really permanent blue was with lapis lazuli. And so that the illuminated manuscripts, you know, had to use ground up lapis. I mean, which is, you know, <laughs> it's still expensive, but certainly was expensive then. And, um, but, you know, I mean, there were things like indigo, but that's different. And that's not sort of permanent in the same way that you get the, the blue. And then the other part of it that actually they emphasized in the exhibit too, is that, you know, uh, blue was the uh, color for the Virgin Mary. Ah. And so uh, so it became really, I mean, it, it it's it's not just a color in a painting. It's like kind of the color. And so that it, everything was revolutionized when 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 they could create blue. But anyway, I'm, it's a little tangential, but I just thought I wanted to throw it, that in. It is. It is. And it isn't. It is and it isn't because there is, you know, the more we think about it, the more we can find reasons to say that blue is different from other colors. Yeah. And that I think is important. If blue is extraordinary and the thread in the tzitzi is supposed to be blue, then I think I think that there's places that we could take ourselves with that. Let me finish the teachings about the blue and then we're, then we're going to have a talit break because um, partly because I, I really, really want to see people's talit talk, um, but partly also because uh, this this next text, uh, anyway, you'll see, you'll see, this is a text that gets me very, very excited. All right. So this is Ramban, meet Ramban. He is not at all the same person as Rambam, yeah? This is Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, a.k.a. Nachmanides. Um, you'll have met him if you've been doing Parshanut with Rabbi Kasha, you'll have met Ramban, okay? Rambam, Maimonides, is a doctor and a philosopher and a thinker and an Aristotelian and thinks in categories, not this guy. This guy, although he is also a medical doctor, interestingly, um, this guy is a mystic. He's an early Kabbalist. He was taught Kabbalah by his teacher, who was called Isaac the Blind. Whenever you have somebody who's blind in the world, this suggestion of additional dimensions of insight. So Ramban was taught by Isaac the Blind, and Ramban's commentary on the Torah is very strongly Kabbalistic, to the point where he'll be in the middle of a thought, and then he'll suddenly say, oh, you know what, I can't talk to you about that. You know, that I got to stop here. Yes, we're getting into we're getting into stuff that is not for not for people who are reading Torah commentary. And he he, he does that quite a lot. Um, but this is what he's got to say about Tchelet. So let's have let's have somebody read this and see what layers it adds to our understanding of Tchelet. Do we have a voice to be Rambat? I can read it. Thank you. The recalling is prompted by the strand oops, Sorry. of Tchelet, <laughs> which alludes to the all or coal that includes all, is in all, and is the ultimate of all. This is why it says reminded all in reference to God's commandments. As the sages have explained, this Tchelet resembles the sea, etc., and ultimately the throne of glory. The resonance of Tchelet and Kol is right there in the word, word itself. But also, Tchelet is the most distant color, the ultimate of all light. As things get further away, they, be, they all begin to, begin to look blue. And that is how Tchelet gets its name. Ooh, interesting. Isn't it a lovely, lovely text? Okay, so first of all, what he is picking up is that right there, this is another hiding in plain sight. 
This is the word trelet. And right there in the middle of trelet is the word kol. Kol, meaning all, meaning everything, meaning the ultimate divine being God. Right in the middle of the word trelet is God. Right there. Yeah, just sitting underneath our noses all this time. Yeah. So the strand of Trelet is not only referring to creation, although creation is magnificent. It's not referring only to the floor of heaven. The floor of heaven is magnificent. It is referring, the strand of Trelet is there to remind us of absolutely everything that is the ultimate of all yeah so the resonance as, as he says the resonance of trelet and kol is right there in the word itself in other words god is colored blue if god has a color the color is blue yeah and that might be why there are so flu so few blue things in the natural world. And by the way, that might also be how the Virgin Mary ends up being dressed in blue. Yeah. If we can think about God as having a color, the color of God is blue. Yeah. It's the divine color. Um, and also, because this second thought is just as good as the first one, I think, it's the most distant color. It's what Rina was saying in the chat. It's the peak of, of the rainbow, the, uh, the middle of the rainbow, the peak of the rainbow. And then this gorgeous thought that as things get further away, they all begin to look blue. Yeah. So trilet is the color of perspective as well. Yeah. And that is how that is how Tchelet gets its name. Leah. Yeah. Um I don't exactly agree. Okay. Because it is most distant in the sky, but look at your wrist. Mm. Our blood our blood is blue. Mm. Um everybody must have known this. Everybody. So let me let me offer uh, an understanding of the word nefesh that I learned from my teacher, whose yacht site is coming up. He was called Rafael Lowy. We we know that the word nefesh. We think of the word nefesh as meaning soul, right? It's one of the it's one of the Hebrew words for soul. Yeah. Oh, lovely, lovely things coming into the chat there. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Um, the word the word nefesh is one of the Hebrew words for soul. There are other words. There is nefesh. There is ruach. There is neshama. There is chaya. There is yichida. Um, there, there are multiple words for soul. Nefesh in the ancient understanding was the part of your soul that lived in your body, that flowed in your bloodstream. In other words, the distinction between the physical and the spiritual wasn't being drawn in the same place. There was a dimension of your soul that kept you alive, that went round and round in your body. So it does make sense that the blood should be blue. Yeah, that when we look at it, we see blue. And I reckon we could go to very interesting places as well. You know, if you spill it, then it turns red. Yeah. Um, interesting. Very, very interesting. Okay, so the element of the divine in our body, also blue. Lovely, 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 lovely. Okay, talit break, talit break. Thank you, Rina. Talit break. Who's got a talit that they want to bring on the call? Mm -hmm. Put your hand up, Rina. I can hear. I can hear that it's you. Rina has one. Florine has one. Okay, this class might run a little long, but I feel that this exchanging is really important. My goodness, what a lot of us there are. 
Rina, let me let me start with you because there is noise behind you. So uh, there, is, I, I I don't know. You, we just have a bad transmission, so okay. it's completely okay. quiet here. All right. Huh. Let me let me start. No dogs. With no, no spouses. Nothing. Okay. Um, so um, this talit, if everyone can see, was a gift. Uh, to me uh, from my mother when she had her adult bat mitzvah in her 60s, Zichrona Livracha. And um, we found an artist, uh, a Jewish craftswoman, so this is a unique piece. Uh, it's woven. The green color is because I inherited my green eyes from my mother. Um, so not only do I remember her, that she gave this to me when she studied for several years for her bat mitzvah, but it, to me, it represents the evolution of Jewish spirituality. And every time I wear it, I, I, I feel that very deeply. My mother was not permitted a bat mitzvah when she was a young girl. When I was a young girl turning into a woman, I was not allowed on the bima over Shabbos. Uh, I was not allowed to touch a Torah scroll. I was permitted to chant Haftarah before Shabbat came in. And you have to have the context here. I was six when the first female rabbi in the United States was ordained. I was in college when the first conservative female rabbi was ordained. And I was eight when a woman in this country could obtain a credit card without a co-signature from her father or her husband. Mm. So when I wrap myself in this talit, I, I feel the evolution of our consciousness. And I also feel how special it is that my daughter is of a different generation. And this is this is her lineage and her legacy. Beautiful. Thank you, Rina. Thank you, thank you. Let me continue. Uh, somebody else. I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go around my screen. I see hands up. Um, Susan. Let me go to Susan. I'm just gonna go across the top row of my uh, of my screen. Uh, Susan. It, it isn't actually Susan, it's me. It's my, you, Mark. Yes. And this is the talit that I made myself. This is the Atara. Mm. It is a cross stitch of some sort. And in each corner, uh, this, this one has my name, Moshe Hirsch. Wow. And I, I, I did the tzitzit myself. Uh, this one, what does it say? It, it's uh, just a, uh, a design. It's a uh, Star of David. And uh, let's see what's in the next corner. <laughs> it's another Star of David. And in the last corner, it's a, a, a Kesser Torah, the, the uh, crown of the Torah. Uh -huh. uh, and I did this myself. Uh, I took the... Uh, the fabric I bought, but I uh, frayed the edges and, and, and tied the knots like a regular uh, talit. Wow. And I made this myself. Thank you. <laughs> I hope that I hope that this is inspiring, by the way, for people. Um, that's that's lovely. I wish you wish you health to wear it, like we say where I come from. Yeah, may you wear it, may you wear it long and with joy. Uh, Florine. Well, I think I have to put it on. Big. Okay. okay. I, I will put you on big. Okay. This is amazing. This is a Tariq bag that my grandmother, whom I never met, made, probably in Lublin, Poland. I estimate it's between 110 and 160 years old. And when my brother died, he found my father's talit, which was in this bag. And this is at least a hundred. Tell us. It's at least, my God, it's falling apart. It's in pieces. Okay. But it's, the people were poor. 
And so they had these very small talitos, is that the plural? Yeah. And um, you can see how differently they were made because they had no money. Yeah. And so it's 110 to 160 years old. That's amazing. I, I bring it every Yom Kippur. <laughs> I, I hold it against my chest. <laughs> Because sometimes things are too fragile to add. It's, it's, all, it's all the threads are falling off. Okay. This is how small the bags were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. The the big talit, the the talit gadol. You know, they've been getting bigger and bigger. Um, and uh, I, I should briefly mention that for people who want to wear their tzitzia all the time, it's called a talit katan, and you'll have seen it. It looks like a kind of um, uh, uh, kind of vest. Um, with oh. a, not, not American vest, English vest. Um, uh, what do I mean? Like a t-shirt, mm. almost uh -huh. a, sleepless, uh, a sleeveless t-shirt with the tzitzia on the corners. This is glorious. Uh, Dana, I know that you wanted to share. Do you want to go next? Oh, <laughs> I had to laugh. As Rabbi Stoba has mentioned, I do own several tawits. Um, from years, from over the years, I've had some from Katrina. I've lost one or two in Katrina. And this one in particular is one of my favorites because it, it does not say the prayer. It says, Ki Mitzion Te which I've never seen a Talit say that in my entire life. <laughs> um, so I was very intrigued when I bought it after, that was my first Talit after I lost mine in Katrina. But, um, and I wear this one on high holidays mostly and... And then I have one more, it's the last one, it's just a plain tally, but it's special because it was given to me by a friend, family, who has an artistic child. Wow. Okay. So, and every time I wear it on Minions, mostly, you know, for Minions that I did this morning or Minions that I did whenever I just think of them because it's just, you know, it's a nice towel. Thank you. Turn it around so we can see it. That's a blue or a purple stripe? It's purple. Yeah. Purple. Lovely. And then I do, I do have one more that I got in the last couple of years, which reminded me it was beautiful because it was worn by a former Holocaust survivor. And mm -hmm. Rabbi Silva would know this. It was Janine Burke. That's right. Um, more her Tawit that I admired her so much. And I, I got hers in the last couple of years. I got the same one that she had, which was turquoise, multi stripes of turquoise. Beautiful. Thank you, Dana. Okay. You see. Yeah. Let's see who else. And we and we notice, by the way, that um, the uh, we've we've been talking about, you know, the tali is a uh, it's a vessel for the tzitzit, but also there are these layers of meaning, just like there are layers of meaning implied in the tzitzit. So, too, there are layers of meaning kind of woven into the fabric of our tali talk. Um Jeremy. Yeah. Okay, I just I just uh, bought a, ta a talit um, last week because I have an an older one that was very narrow, and uh, I wanted a full size one, which I never had because I wanted one that I could cover myself with. So I I got this one, and it's very big, and it has it has blue stripes, but it it on the on the it's it it doesn't have a blue a blue thread that's right that's right yeah you have to buy those specially if you want them but it's it's a completely kosher talit even if it doesn't have the blue thread for centuries uh jews have oh. had talit with white thread and, and i have another one that's my older one and it's it's narrow it, it's this one and it's more like a scarf yeah 
I think that's like the German style. It is. It is. It yeah, is. So it was fancier, like what like what you said. But the one that the one that I got is like more of a yeah. covering kind of that's for, beautiful. The, for the davening. That's beautiful. Thank you. Well, yeah, I I've heard Talitot described as hugs before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's something about being embraced by your Tully. Thank you. Um, Hal and Kathy. Let me spotlight you. Uh, you'll need to unmute. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, this this was a gift from our daughter Maya and from Kathy to me. And it was made actually by the rabbi's mother-in-law, Wendy Light, oh. Oh. saw this fabric, uh, this pattern, and thought it looked like the stitching on a baseball. So <laughs> the, the collar uh, is the Los Angeles <laughs> fabric, which I want to point out is blue. And that, <laughs> I think, very, very significant. But uh, they they got it for me because I I follow the Dodgers. So oh okay okay. And then this is my talus, which I think a lot of you probably have seen. Um, and so um, a friend of mine made it for me, and uh, it's actually I mean she put it together and then also you know tied the, uh, the seat seat. Uh, but anyway, it's made out of four uh, placemats. I don't know. I'm holding the placemat right here. There are four of them that are, they, she sewed together and they were imported by her family. Um, uh, they were from um, uh, Germany, uh, Central Europe, and then moved to San Francisco in the right at the turn of the century around 1900. And so their, their, their business was importing linens uh, from Central Europe. And so this was, so it is, I guess the, you know, the placemats are um, more than a hundred years old, but, uh, you know, she inherited all these placemats, uh, well, all these linens, but she wasn't going to use these as actual placemats. So she, so she made me a yeah. topless and I, just, I, I love it. I yeah. really, so thank you. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it was one of the first Talita I noticed when I came to Ikara as well. It's uh, <laughs> these, these unique ones. That's great. Um, okay, Liddy, I am coming to you. Uh, let's spotlight you. Cool. Um, this is my Talita skirt. Oops, hold on, let me on, on blur. Hold on. There, um, it's got it's got birds on it, which are my favorite. It doesn't have uh, words, but it has birds on there. It has blue stripes, and it took me. Um, I've had my talit for about since 2014. Um, you know, like other people have said, you know, as as women, I, I as a woman, I never thought, oh, I should have a talit. I didn't grow up wearing a talit. Um, my dad wore one, but that was it. My brothers never did. Uh, but when um, when I got married, when you know when same sex marriage became legal in Minnesota, back in twenty thirteen, and we decided to get married, my wife and I got new talit for our wedding. So I, this is my first talit. So I always it read my you know I wore it for the first time on my wedding day, and um, I always feel you know wrapped in that whenever i'm wearing it and what you said about it being like a hug is exactly you know what i what i feel when i'm wearing it, it always i feel incomplete when i'm davening and and not wearing my telly so this, this is it that's beautiful how lovely there are i have seen a telly top being used as the hooper as well as wedding canopies it's uh it's possible to whoops it's possible to use um, a talit or more than one family talit to be a chupa as well. So that is something that I've seen. Judith, I think that you are the the last show and tell for this evening. So let's, we'll need you to unmute. There we are. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you can see it because of the blur, but um, this is... Okay. 
got like a scene of Jerusalem on it. I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, um, when I first moved to Israel, I bought Tally Tote for both of my parents. And the one that I just showed is my mom. I actually do also wear my dad's. Um, and I bought my mom's at Yad Lakashish, um, which is Lifeline for the Old. I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but it's a workshop where the elderly um, do crafts and it's a very special place. And when my mom passed away in 2019, I took back her tally, her tally and I took back my dad's when he died as well. And I just love to wear my parents' tally tote because it just reminds me of them. And it also reminds me of my life in Israel and Jerusalem. And, and like most of the women here, I, I didn't grow up wearing a tally. Um, I wasn't allowed on the Bema either. And um, I just love the feeling of the hug. Um, Thank you. And, uh, and as a hug from, from your parents as well. Exactly, exactly. It's just beautiful. Sura, I see your hand up. Sura? I, I, yes, I'm here. Yeah. I don't actually yeah. wear it, but I bring two different tally totes with me to synagogue, but I don't feel quite comfortable really wearing them yet. One is the one that my mother gave my daughter for her bat mitzvah, which she has never worn since that day. And the other is a painted one from, it was made in Israel. The other one is a painted one, um, quite similar to, um, to Judy's, um, to Judith Spungen's, um painted one also. And um, I bring them with me every Shabbat but I don't really ever put them on. Okay. But it's a, it's a journey. With, a, with an object like this, it really is a journey, especially if we didn't grow up with it, yeah? I remember as a very young child sitting on my father's lap and twiddling his tzitzit around my finger, yeah? And that was, that was just something that Daddy wore and my brother got one for his bar mitzvah, and that was, that was it. That was that was the story. So I think that we, I think that we evolve into mitzvot. And if you're if you're going to be a tali person, sorry, you will know, the time will be right. There will be a day. There will be a morning where where it will be it will be right for you to uh, for you to wear a tali or not. It might be it might be that it's not for you. It might be that there are gifts. But yeah, we um we evolve into these these objects are our are, are journeys for us okay so let me summarize where we've got to let me pull together some threads you'll pardon the pun because we have one more text that i want to do and then and, and it, it's a biggie and then i then i want to finish with a poem so we've We've established that, um, at least according to the tradition, the talit is a vehicle for the tzitziot. But we have seen that as soon as you put tzitziot on a four-cornered piece of cloth, then the cloth acquires meaning as well. I think that these days we cannot separate the significance of a talit from the significance of the tzitzit. It's all one. We wrap ourselves in it. And what have we learned? We've learned that in um, we've learned that in both a left brain way and a right brain way, these tzitzit represent the divine or a connection with the divine. And because a Jewish symbol is um, a, a Jewish symbol always has more to it than just one meaning. We've also discovered that there is this sense of, of, of lift that comes with the symbolism of the tzitzit and the talit. So um, uh, sea and sky and heaven and sapphires and that, that, that feeling of moving up 
and uh, dreams, blue is the color of dreams, and blue is the color of distance, and blue is the color of God. And all of that is packed into the symbolism of the Talit, as well as the personal symbolism to us, whether it be dodgers, whether it be wedding, whether it be parents, whether it be history. Yeah, so they become extraordinarily resonant Jewish objects for us, which is why I want to go next to and penultimately to the idea that when you put on a talit, there is a kavanah. Have people come across this uh, this word kavanah before? It has it has a few meanings. Okay, so first of all, kavanah means intention or it, intentionality, focus in prayer. You'll hear people saying, "I've got absolutely no kavanah this morning," or "That was really that singing was really good for my kavanah." But it's also regarded as. Um, a good habit and meritorious that when you're about to perform a mitzvah, you think yourself into it a little bit first. So a kavanah that will work very well for all mitzvot is here I am ready and willing to perform the mitzvah of whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but there are different kavanot in different sidurim for putting on talit. If you look in the left shalem, there is a kavanah for putting on a talit. If you look at different sidurim, you will find different kavanot. And one that I want to share with you is my favorite. Be and buckle down, it's, it's a long one, but I'll take us through it piece by piece. It comes from a sidur sfarad. It comes from the Safadi Siddur. So the first piece, and you'll find this in other Siddurim as well, is this quotation. I'm, I'm not going to read out loud, but I will invite you to read. Let me just size up a bit here so that we can be certain that everybody can see. Is the text clear for everyone? Can you read? Let me give you a moment to read. So the, the long kavana begins with this verse. It's the verse from Psalm 104. And look at the additional layers that it's giving us here. This is an image, you know, human beings where Talita, who was it who said, as above, so below, as below, so above? Human beings were Talita, so obviously God has a Talit, right? What is God's talit? God's talit is the sky. Duh. It's blue, which is God's color. Yeah. So God wraps God's self in the sky like a talit. And we invoke that before we put on our own talitot. You spread out the heavens like a curtain. Yeah. When you lift up your talit to put it on, this verse gets said at that point where you unwrap your talit and you spread it out. And then there is this long kavana um, that uh, for the sake of the unification of the Holy, the Holy Blessing One, this is a, a Kabbalistic formula that every mitzvah has the intentionality of um, bringing God back to God's self. We can talk about that another time. It's this bit here that I want us to look at. Whoops. So behold, I am wrapping my body with tzitzit. May you wrap my soul in the light of the tzitzit, which adds up to 613. We know how that works now. So in the same way as God wraps God's self in a talit that is made of sky, we wrap ourselves in a talit that is made not of fabric, not of fringes, but of pure light. A talit is made of light. Yeah, that's the deep secret that's hiding in plain sight. We're not wrapping ourselves in fabric 
on a symbolic level, we are wrapping ourselves in light. And we go on and we say, just as I cover myself with fabric in this world, may I in the Garden of Eden be wrapped in light. May I have a talit in the world to come and may that talit be made of light. And may my talit, final, final um, piece of symbolism here, may this talit protect me. We haven't looked at this symbolism before, but I think we intuit it. When we put on a talit, we feel safe underneath it. Yeah. So this is invoking the idea like an eagle that rouses its nestlings hovering over its young. That is, that's an image from the end of the Torah. Yeah. So to all of these layers, to the reminder of the mitzvah, uh, the fringes, yeah, that remind us of God, that remind us of the sea, that remind us of the sky, that reminds us of creation, that reminds us of the throne of glory. When we wrap ourselves in a talit down here, we are imitating God's wrapping God's self in a talit in that parallel or upwards dimension that one day we too will attain to when our talitot will no longer be made of fabric, but they will be made of light. Then you say the blessing on the talit, we wrap ourselves up in light. And then, and this is, I've been waiting for, I don't know how many years to teach this with a group of Ikarites. There are three more verses from the Psalms. They're not contiguous. Um, sorry, they, they are contiguous. This is, this is from Psalm 36, which is a Psalm that we don't know so well. And I want to focus particularly, notice that you've got all of the symbolism here. You have the wings, you have the stream, you have the light, you have the extension. Yeah, it's all in there, all of those things compounding together. This verse here, whoops, come on. For with you is the source of life. In your light shall we see light. When you go up to the Torah at Ikar, you will see that between readings, it's covered with a cloth. This is what is embroidered on that cloth. In your light shall we see light is something I know that it's on the neck piece of one of Rabbi Brous's Talitot as well. But in your light we shall see light. It's a very Ikar thing. And it's right there every time we put on the tali. So we wrap ourselves in mitzvot. We unite ourselves as well as we can with the divine. We wrap ourselves in light. And then because of that light, we ourselves see better. And that's all there on, on subliminal levels. That is all there when we wrap ourselves in our talitot. Okay. Let me stop sharing and take a look at the chat. Yeah. I can, um, I can, what I'm going to do with the texts, Kim, uh, that light then is the Akar logo, I think it is. Um, what I'm going to do with the texts, Kim, is I'm going to I'm going to put them in the database. Um, the uh, uh, Akar has a database, and I will put them in that. Or drop me a line, and I will email the texts. Okay. Let me make a note. It's it's just easier for me to email that. It's on my list to do tomorrow. Um, okay, so yeah, I think that the light is indeed the Akar logo, and Kanaf, the corners of the of the Talita, on the corners on the Kanaf, you need to put a tzitzit. It's also Kanaf is also the word for wing. Yeah, they're the same, they're the same word in Hebrew. 
Yeah, so a tali is like wings, right? Final thoughts, final questions. I have a poem I want us to finish with, and then we're going to count the omer. But any final thoughts, final questions? So once again, let me draw the threads together. Yeah, when we put on a talit, there are so many things going on. There are so many layers that are happening. Remember the word talit from tal. Yes, lying on something. So lying, lying on us when we put on our talit, other other whole system of mitzvot, and the color of the sea, and the color of the sky and the process of creation, and light, and God, and protection, and the wish that we will continue to be clothed in light. It just, you know, like the color blue, things get bluer as they get further and further away, like the color blue, the talit just goes on and on and on. Let me share a poem to close. Here is a poem that I absolutely wish I'd written, but I didn't write it. It's written by uh, the Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai. Would somebody like to read? Do we have a reader? Yeah, I'll read. I love, I love Amichai. Okay, but we still have static, but we can, we can bear with it, can't we? Uh, then I won't. There, no, it's no okay. Way. No, I don't want to shut you down. No, no. no. There's the words are the words. Yeah. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. Rena, come on. Let's push through. Let's push through. Think of it as the sound of the sea. Uh, but I am not hearing the sound of the sea. <laughs> but we are, and it's all okay. I'll keep uh, uh, whoever put on a talus when he was young will never forget, taking it out of the soft velvet bag, opening the folded shawl, spreading it out, kissing the length of the neckband embroidered or trimmed in gold, then swinging it in a great swoop overhead like a sky, a wedding canopy, a parachute, and then winding it around his head as in hide and seek, wrapping his whole body in it, close and, and slow, snuggling into it like the cocoon of a butterfly, then opening would-be wings to fly. And why is the talus striped and not checkered black and white like a chessboard? Because squares are finite and hopeless. Stripes come from infinity, and to infinity they go like airport runways where angels land and take off. Whoever has put on a talus will never forget. When he comes out of a swimming pool or the sea, he wraps himself in a large towel, spreads it out again over his head, and again snuggles into it close and slow, still shivering a little, and he laughs and blesses. Isn't it just wonderful? Thank you. Thank you, Rina. Isn't it, isn't it just stunning? I will share the texts. I will share the texts. And it, it might be that this would be one to print out and keep in your talus bag. I like carrying stuff around in my talus bags. I, I have quite a few bits of paper and other bits and pieces in there. But this is a lovely one to carry in your talus bag. Yeah. And it pulls together so much of the symbolism that we've that we've explored tonight. Let me just do a final look at the chat. Okay, great. These are these are goodbyes and thank yous. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, we have one more thing that we need to do. Uh, we are still counting the Omer. So if you would like to rise, um, it's not Lagba Omer anymore, ladies and gents. It's, it's another day now. So go ahead, please go ahead, unmute if you would like to.
and we will count. Today is 34 days, which is four weeks and six days of the Omer. And then this verse from Psalm 67, Elohim Yochonenu Vivarachenu Ya'er Panav Itanu Selah. That here is the light again. Just one more time to take home with us. Ya'el Panav, may, his, may, uh, may God's face shine with light. So there's the light to take home with us this evening. Thank you so much to everyone for coming. And um, I will see you, I will see you again next week. I will send the texts. Do you want me to just take a look at my at my running order and share what we're going to be looking at next uh, next time? Because I can do that. I don't carry that one in my head, so bear with me for just a minute. This should not take very long. Here we are. Next time we're going to look at Allah. A rabbi should not have favorites, right? It's a given that a rabbi should not have favorites, but Allah is my favorite session in this series. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. And I will see you next week. <laughs>